Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of the TMG Fireside Chat, the podcast series that is dedicated to the fire protection and life safety industry and discussions with industry leaders on issues and solutions affecting our markets. I'm your host, John Mackey. In today's episode, we'll be talking with John Demeter, the president of Wesco, and the topic is focused on the history of the market, specifically around consolidation, number of changes recently announced around big publicly traded companies, specific to 3M and Carrier. Uh, But then we also talk about uh, where consolidation fits in our market, um, why it's happening, and what the uh, forecast has uh, going forward. Um, We also talk about um, the strength and the resilience of the industry. Um, the, you know, the simple fact that we're co-driven, uh, we're built around you know, a number of models around recurring revenue. And we also talk about um, this concept that bigger isn't necessarily better in fire protection. And I'll let history speak for itself with how that evolution is uh, shown to be somewhat ineffective. As always, please take the time to subscribe, like, and follow the Mackey Group blog on our website, MackeyGroupLLC.com, and the Mackey Group channel on YouTube. Uh, we plan on pulling together more fireside chats as we attend industry events uh, throughout the year. And you can also find contact details for John and me in the podcast notes, as well at the end of the video. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, and welcome to the, uh, episode four of the DMG Fireside Chat. In today's episode, we are sitting down with a fire protection industry friend of mine and a mentor, uh, John Demeter. Hello, John. Good afternoon. Hello, John. Yeah, I think I've learned probably as much from you over the years as you have from me, but probably even more to tell you the truth. But Uh, it's it's a great relationship. Yeah, it's It's good to be here, John. Really, as you're doing a good thing for the industry. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, Thanks for uh, taking the time to sit down with us. Uh, As (laughs) you and I always talk about. we talk quite often about a lot of different things in the industry and, and uh, we have an opportunity to share some of that, those thoughts and perspectives uh, through the podcast. And uh, hopefully the audience finds it informative and, and useful and in some way and, and just sharing different perspectives of what, what's going on around us um, because there's a lot of things, a lot of moving parts and pieces right now. We certainly are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so John, for the benefit of the audience, um, you know, would you mind sharing your background, talk about your growth in the fire protection industry and, you know, and what you do now? Sure. Um, in a nutshell, I, I, I spent most of my adult life in fire protection, uh, you know, about 15 years in, in, in a, with a company called RC Industries, a manufacturer of hand portable fire extinguishers. That was a family business that I got back into after I got out of, uh, after I left my first real job uh, after, after college. Um, and I ran RC uh, for about 15 years. Um, we were based here in central New Jersey and sold that business to Kitty, uh, late 1980s, early 1990. Um, and from there, I, I, I got involved with, uh, the company that was then called wall parts and supply. Don wall was a partner of mine for, for a few years. I eventually bought out Don and wall parts, uh, morphed into, into Wesco, um, had a difficult time figuring out how to make money in, in, in the parts and supply business. I, I see people doing it now and I scratch my head going, oh, I just don't know how they do it. Uh, but we, we were in the parts and supply business. I was in there with Don and then, and then independently. And um, 1994 came along and they shut down all the Halon 1301 uh, uh, factories. We knew what Halon, we knew what the Halons were, of course, but we weren't really involved in that business. And but we were plugged into the fire distributor market, you know, fire company distributors. That's who we we, we sold these parts to. And we started getting um, phone calls from distributors saying, you got 500 pounds of 13 to one. Do you know anybody who's buying any? And we would say, no, we don't. <laughs> but that same day, somebody would call and say, hey, I need 500 pounds of 13 to one. You know anybody who's selling any? We go, yeah, we do. <laughs> so we end up, you know, buying it for five and selling it for eight and did that for a little while and uh, thought that there was an opportunity here to to grow in the business uh, and did. And we ended up, you know, buying recycling equipment and getting serious about it. And um, I think our first bid was, was, was Kitty Airspace who gave us our first break in this business. And we began 
supplying them uh, with with recycled Hadron 1301 and Hadron 1211, and then 227, the whole range of gases. Uh, but for the last oh 25 years, uh, we, we're 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 in the clean agent fire suppression business. You know, we moved from we moved from 1301 to 1211 to 227 to 125 Novex 1230. So we're we we got both feet planted in this business. We sell bulk to those that need bulk. We do service work to those that need service work. We do recycling uh, to people who just want to have their gas clean, and um, that's where we are. Happy, got a good crew here. You know, loyal crew. Uh, been with me for a long time, and we uh, we have a good time. That's great and a great story. You know, I think that uh, one, your entrepreneurial spirit, obviously with the, you know, with the RC, you know, extinguisher business first and then being able to pivot uh, into other aspects of just the broader fire protection space and starting to realize where other opportunities are starting to present themselves. Actually, the, the entrepreneurial spirit starts with with my grandmother making booze during during a, during a prohibition and, and, and running a, ser- a, a string of speakeasies. That's where <laughs> I think my, my entrepreneurial spirit uh, comes from. But uh, <laughs> That's great. That. Well, she was arrested <laughs> twice. A <laughs> uh, uh, whole nother podcast there for sure. Podcast, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, well, let's, you know, I, one of the things I want to talk about in this episode is just all the moving parts and pieces we have in our industry. Uh, we're not going to be able to summarize it in 30 minutes, but um, I do think there's an opportunity to kind of hit some of the, the, the big highlights, especially with some of the recent news. Um, I think that um, one area I'd like to start with is around uh, Carrier's announcement from April 13th of this year, just two weeks ago, uh, for, from our recording uh, pr- perspective, and their announcement that they're selling or spinning off both Kit of Fire and as well as their security portfolio. They're um, considering. They're considering. I, they're I don't considering. Think- yeah, they haven't. They have found a suitor yet, but they're exploring their options. Um. I find it very interesting, just given 18 months ago, they spun off or sold the Chubb fire and security business based in London, yeah. the API group. Um, mm-hmm. That transaction went reported at about $3 billion US. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a very large uh, acquisition for API. And I wish them all the best in integrating that business. But, you know, what's your take with regard to what's going on with, with you know, these big publicly traded companies being, you know, carrier and their decision to, to you know, do something with Kitta. Mm-hmm. And then you look at what JCI is doing with the merger of Tyco and, 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 you know, the role that Ansel has in our industry, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, I think we've always wondered, at least for the last 10 years, you know, does fire and security fit in with these large industrial corporations? Do they, is there a place there? You know, uh, you know, there was you know, Kitty was owned by the Brits and then bought by UTC. And then within UTC, they were spun around a couple of that UTC. Remember, UTC had that fire and security division. Yeah. And I think that lasted for about 18 months. Mm-hmm. They had a big announcement. They were reorganizing all these groups under UTC fire and security. And publicized it and then it was over then they just kind of broke it back up again and 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 rearranged uh you know the the pieces so um it's been going on for a while you know and and we've been talking about you know is is kitty for sale for a while now you know when they were you know what's going to happen to 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 to, uh, to special hazard fire suppression in kitty um with the utc you know uh, 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 uh breakup yeah now we see it so um yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I think the 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 problem that I see with big companies owning our pieces of our business at they're so big that the stuff that we sell, you know, the systems and everything that's involved in that become line items, you know, in 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 a very, very, very large, you know, book of products. You know, it's like an Amway book, you know, and somewhere you're on page 837 and that's where special hazards is. I'm exaggerating, of course, but sure. you get my point that that we just become a line item or line items. And, you know, and, and I've heard this from from our friends, you know, who went from being, you know, uh, employed by a 
good size but privately held company to a conglomerate. And it's it's different. You know, it's it's really different. And I and I, I was saying this 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, that if you were a distributor, um Kitty, Ansel, or whoever, you knew who your who your your sales manager was from your manufacturer. You knew okay. that guy or that yeah, you knew that. You knew their boss. You probably had dinner with their boss, and you probably even knew their boss's boss. You, you knew the whole chain. You know, and I keep on bringing up Ned Payne, but you know, Ned Payne attended every single NAFED meeting ever <laughs> since I think he started. Um, but now, you know, that started changing. You know, where where the 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 relationship between the distributor and their suppliers changing dramatically. I think. I don't yeah, think. I think what you just highlighted is, again, the strength of relationships, right? Uh, to your point about, you know, everyone knew Ned Payne. Uh, I grew up in this industry at Ansel. Um, and, you know, we were making decisions specific to the Ansel portfolio. Uh, and this is back in the late 2000s with, I'll say, a little influence uh, from Tyco, but nowhere near the, the influence that you see JCI have today. Mm -hmm. um, and even to the point where... Um, I could tell you what our investment would be on new products every year under Ansel. Uh, and like clockwork, here comes the next, you know, clean agent system. Here comes the next foam technology. Here comes mm -hmm. the next restaurant or mining mm -hmm. system solution. Um, and today, because of the short-term view, a lot of these publicly traded companies have, number one. And number two, like you said, now fire protection is a line item. Yeah. on the balance sheet and not necessarily a strategic aspect of their portfolio. Yeah. Um, we're not seeing that evolution of new products coming out again and again and again. Right. And and yeah. throw on top of that. Okay. So, I mean, a, 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 a general manager coming in new to, to this business here, let's say at, at a, at a, at a large company, he's going to hear about 1301 and 1211. He's going to hear the history about HFCs. And now he's going to be shown uh, fluoroketones and PFAS, and he's going to go, how much money should we be investing into this business until we know exactly where it's going? I mean, the, the, these are, I, I think, again, I, I never operated, you know, at that level there. You have, but it's got to it's got to throw a monkey wrench into that whole capital investment, you know, uh, uh, part of the business. We invest our money. Does it does it make any sense to you know to invest money here, or do we wait for things to to settle down? Yeah, and I don't know what what the answer is. Um, I I recently did a released a podcast a conversation I had with with Paul Rivers um, coming out of uh, yeah you know, his differentiating PFAS presentation at the yeah. annual forum, and he made a reference to um, a program that NIST offered back in the early two thousands, and the government was trying to figure out a way to find uh, replacement suppression agents um, since halons were coming out of the market and um, HFCs were, you know, coming in, but not necessarily the most environmentally friendly solution. Um, and NIST was offering it, I think it was somewhere between 45 and a $50 million grant to go <laughs> develop the next product. Uh, and sure enough, the next day, Paul released Novak 1230 uh, with 3M. So it was just interesting to see, okay, now where's the influencers on the government side to say, okay, as it relates to investment for the next agent, um, someone has to create the incentive because to your point, the behavior of the publicly traded companies is that we're not going to invest for the long haul and waiting to see what's going to happen over the next 10 or 15 years. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're looking at the next five. Oh, okay, so, so, so we started this part of the conversation with, with the, with the, the story announcement it was a story you know in the wall street journal saying that that um that uh they were considering carry was considering spinning off fire and security you know maybe they wanted that story you know to to come out and maybe they wanted it out there but i i, I are they going through these same discussions here i i was i was um w at a long uh dinner with a uh, somebody in the industry somebody who you know uh who worked for one of these big companies and and was in a corporate meeting um, with the chief financial officer, kind of laying out, here's where we are. And uh, uh -huh. I think the, the graph on the screen was 
here's our, our minimum acceptable return on investment, this line across the middle. And they plotted where all the divisions were. And everybody was above the line except fire and security. They were or parts of fire. I don't know if it's fire and security. They're below the line. This is probably going back seven or eight years. I was like, you know, I'm sure it's changed a bit, but it, it wasn't it, you know, it, it wasn't looked at as a as a real money maker there. I think it, you know, our, our industry as a whole is not necessarily a short term play. I think if you know it if you're gonna be in fire, it is a long term strategy. And when I say long term, five to ten years, right? Or you can even make a case you've seen some owners been have been in the space for 25, 30, 40 years, right? Yeah. Um, it's 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 very consistent with regard to growth. It's very consistent with regard to return on investment. Um, where you're not going to see these big spikes and these you know significant downfalls uh, yeah. that you might f- see in other industries. Yeah. If 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 carrier does end up selling fire and security, um, maybe it goes private. You know, and maybe you know, and maybe 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 it goes private. But you know, the, the I wonder if ten years from now, five years from now. Would we be better off as an industry with all these big companies broken up in, in private hands, private equity, family businesses, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. um, run as privately owned standalone companies or as part of conglomerates? Um, now you, you could say, well, yeah. it's just the capital, but yeah. okay, there's a lot of capital out there. I mean- you know, your private equity and your 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 company needs you know you know ten million dollars for a plant expansion. You're going to find that money. If it's justified, right? You're going to find that. Oh, money. sure, sure. I think I think the answer to your question is it's both, right? And as, and as it relates to publicly traded companies and privately held companies, and the reason I say that is just, and from a broader perspective, you know. All my market research says that our industry is about a $14 billion market. And that includes everything in fire. That's the manufacturers, that's the uh, labor, and that's the uh, uh, contractors, uh, both service and installation. Mm -hmm. So call it a $14 billion market. And so in that context, there's enough space for publicly traded companies to play in here. And we see them. I mean, there's probably five or 10 of them off the top of my head. I mean, I don't necessarily need to go through all of them. But there's a, such a long tail of mom and pop businesses, thousands of them. Um, getting smaller. Then, so again, tail's, getting, tail's getting smaller. It's getting smaller, but when you still have 10,000 companies and you recognize that these PE firms, you know, as big as they are, rough, roughly, they've probably only acquired 500 companies. Right. Yeah. And when they go into a market and buy within the, those 500 companies, pick a geography where they're at. Within six months, three more companies pop up in that same geography. Yeah. Right. And then within, you know, 10 years, not all three are going to make make it, but one will. And that one company in 10 years is not eligible to sell. So now we continue to see this churn. And we've seen this churn. You know, I've talked about it offline. We've seen this churn for 30 or 35 years, maybe longer. Well, you know, it, it's maybe may longer. And, and, and sometimes the motivation is not always, hey, there's in town with a checkbook and he's buying people sometimes the motivation is you don't like your boss and he really upset you right. you're leaving you're going across the street you're taking a you know a folder full of, of customer phone numbers and you're starting over yourself and that of course that the battles that ensue over that we've seen that and that's that was the original you know breakup of the or deconstruction of the industry and reconstruction of the industry because they you see what happens when big company is you know not run either well or not really like or there's a a, a a a a problem between owner and and technician or owner and sales guy and then they leave so but you yeah, know the, one, the, the, the i think one clear um benefit of what's going on with private equity over the last 10 15 years is that there's an exit plan for for founders you know i mean you know most founders you know they they put their time in they they work their you know knuckles to the bone and, and they want their payday and there's a payday, you know? Oh, absolutely. I also think it creates a vehicle for those 
owners that aren't necessarily ready to retire. Um, they don't necessarily want to put their capital to work anymore because it's just, it's gotten big yeah. enough for them. Yeah. But they yeah. see an opportunity to grow it even further, an opportunity to take care of their employees. Yeah, true. Yeah, what no, have no, you. No. And so it's Without a partner, you know, there's sponsors or partners out there they can they can uh you know start to work with uh and use somebody else's cash to help it grow. Um, yeah. Yeah. and I think that that's healthy as well because um by itself, you know, the resources that owner may have are limited with regards to whether or not they're gonna be able to buy more equipment, you know, deploy new technology, totally. uh, yeah. train their employees. Um, and hire more people. And this investment that we've got coming in from private equity is really shoring that up, right? Mm-hmm. And it's now, because yeah, the labor it, market's it, so competitive, we've got to train people. We've got to yeah. give them good tools and resources to get technology, them. Not, not, not everybody has great technology. Not everybody has, you know, the best way to Zoom paperwork, you know, and processes through your organization. Right. right. So from, from, from your vantage point, out of every ten acquisit private equity or family office acquisitions, how many how many founders stay on, happily stay on? Um, I'm going to say it's probably less than fifteen percent. Less than fifteen. That, so which goes back to your point, right? What's the motivation for them to sell? Well, they want to sell the business yeah. and move to the beach house, or just yeah, you know, right. hang out yeah. their camp, yeah. you know, fish camp. Yeah. Do you, you think you think 85% say, listen, you know, I put my time in, it's time for me to relax and spend time with my family? Yes. Um, mm-hmm. And let's think of the profile. Most of them are probably, you know, starting at the age of, you know, 60-ish. In, in their 60s. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You know, but we, you and I both know other sellers that were 70, 74, 75 right. that yep. sold late, but yep. you know, just got mm-hmm. to a point. Um, and the other thing is that, again, the motivation. Who's coming up behind them? to take over the business. You know, a lot of these right. family businesses were expecting their kids or, you know, extended family right. to get involved and run right. it. Yeah. And we're seeing that, you know, a lot of those businesses don't have that bench, you know, that yeah. that succession plan in place. But 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 where they do, you know, we've got some really strong family businesses still out there. Oh, you know, absolutely. You know, the, the 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 fire lines, the BFPEs, and I'm sure there's a dozen more that, that I am not mentioning now, but a lot of, you know, and and, and I think that speaks to this business, this industry being a a really good place. It's it's very entrepreneurial. You know, you you work hard. You you know, you, not a lot of the the barriers to entry are not all that great, right? It's not it's like a, it's you, attainable. You know, it's right. what it's attainable. I have to go yeah, get a license. Yeah, I have yeah, to get yeah. certified yeah. to do X. You know, we we joke about the rag and taggers, but really, if you wanted to go service portables and do it right, you know, you could do it. You yeah. could. You know, Join NAFED, join FSSA, you know, get a van, you know, get licensed in your state and start doing business. Yes. So that, that's, you know, that that's that's always been, you know, one of the things about this industry that I've always liked. You know, if you want to get into this thing, you could. There's a doorway in. And, and you wonder how that's going to change over the next 10 years. I mean, with this consolidation, you think the motivation, no, I, it's, it probably won't change. I mean, the motivation to split off and start your own business. I, I, I think you, it, what it may do is it actually may, especially look at the buying cycle that we've seen in the last seven years. Um, I think it's going to accelerate those churns, right? So mm-hmm. let's say you see a transaction go down the company, the big company you're working for, they get acquired. You're in your early 30s. You say, you know what? I can do this. You hang a shingle. Mm-hmm. And in 10 years, you build a $10 million company and now you sell it, mm-hmm. right? And versus you holding on that business for 25 years. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I think there's examples that I can share. I'm not going to do it on the podcast, but yeah. where you see a lot of those owners that have done that, um, you know, they, they started in Simplex Canal, left Simplex Canal, built their own, right? They yeah. started, you know, got acquired by Cintas, left Cintas, started their own, right? Um, yeah. And you know, I think that again highlights how healthy the industry is. And to your point, yeah. good, you know, good. aside from that, you have to hustle. I'm not saying it's easy. You have to hustle. Yeah. But the opportunity to to really be yeah. a good fire protection contractor the right yeah. way is out there. Yeah. And 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 some you know, it's we joke a little bit about not liking your boss and quitting and going across the street. Um, but but. You know, some people are just not cut out to to work for large corporations. Right. Just, you know, they just 
and or they've got five years or 10 years with this family owned business run a certain way. And now that's changed. You know, and that's not, I'm not suggesting that's bad. It's just different. You know, a lot of people just aren't cut out for that. Well, there's that old book. It's in my office here somewhere. I don't have time to pull it down, but you know, it's who moved my cheese. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, that's from the, yeah. what the nineties, yeah. but it's a story about, Hey, you know, we're grinding every day. We got these routines and it's this, this, and this, and all of a sudden, boom, Hey, boop. yeah. Right. Right. Someone just moved into, you know, yeah. someone just acquired a business. Now my boss is no longer here. Yeah. Now what's that mean? Right. And that's part of the struggle. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think as individuals, we got to figure out how to work our way and, through and, that. And, and and probably for for every for every guy or gal that that says I'm I'm not cut out for that kind of business life, there's five that say, oh, okay, I'm good with it. You yeah. know, it's you know, there are more people like that, which is good. You know, we need we need, you know, we 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 know people working for big companies and they're perfectly happy with that. And yeah. that's just, the, but it, this allows, and I hope it's I hope that it remains. Um, an opportunity for people who have that entrepreneurial drive to start a business. I hope. I think it will. I think it will. I think there's there's plenty of opportunities. You know, part of the issue is getting the information out about the industry as a whole. I mean, part of the reason why we do these podcasts is to talk yeah. about the strength yeah. of the fire yeah. protection yeah. industry. Yeah. Yeah. Right? We know there's a, a labor I wouldn't call it a crisis, but there's a labor crunch yeah. uh, in yeah. in fire protection as a whole. And how yeah. do you recruit fire sprinkler techs, fire extinguisher techs, special hazard techs, yeah. fire alarm techs? Um, we've got to find a way to get more people into the yeah. industry um, to keep up with the growth. Hey, there, there, there's there's a, a a bunch of people that we know uh, that 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 on May 11th are going to become free to join other companies from 3M when 3M yeah. closes down. It's it's uh, it's Novak 1230 business. Right. That's another another change, significant change to our industry. Again, it you know, here you have a a yeah. sound, you know, suppression agent, uh, you know, 3M's Novak 1230 fluid um that works and 3M's making a decision that they're gonna pull out of the space. Yeah. Um, it's um it's that's interesting. You and I are both are involved actively in FSSA. Yeah. Um and um I've you know, signed up to be part of that PFAS task force and trying to, you know, find uh, the right messaging, the right information, the flow of information um, about, you know, the differences between PFASs across the board, the difference between fluoroketone-based yeah. products, HFCs, and firefighting foam and our path forward with regard to mitigating yeah. foam. Um, but, you know, to your point about, you know, 3M, it goes back to, again, the strategic yeah. intent of 3M and the stock price um, and um, yeah. 3M's decision to pull out. I mean, as you know, 3M I, it was in, at the forefront of firefighting foam back in the 60s. So, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, they, yeah, you're right. And then, and then they were into CEA, CEA 410, right? That, that yeah. didn't last uh, very long. Yeah. But, um, you know, Paul Rivers gets, gives, you've heard the explanation more than once, a great explanation distinguishing between good PFAS and bad PFAS. Absolutely. And he's convinced and he backs it up with, with, with research and science that says, no, it's, it's completely different. Um, and, and it is, we know, we know that it is, it's no, clear it's... that it is. I think our job is to explain that to a customer who's hearing for the third time in, in 20 years, wait a second. I thought you said that this stuff was the good stuff now. And that stuff that 1301 that caused the hole in the ozone layer was bad. And, and 227 was good and, and that was bad. And yeah. now you're saying this is good. And it, it, yes, it's good. And then when you go through the Paul Rivers um, review, the person, I hope I'm wrong about this, but the person is going, is going to go, but PFOS, but PFOS, yeah. good men, but, but PFOS, you know, I, I, you, you know, we can sit in we can sit in a, in a, in a Paul Rivers hour long discussion and be riveted by everything he's saying, but <laughs> is that buyer gonna give it the same attention? I don't know. It, it's 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 to be it's to be determined. I I know that that's to say. I'm so glad that we've got this organization together. In the you know the PFAS task force. Yeah. I think they've got a, a a lot of work to do, and I think it's it's staffed with some great people. I think I think it can be done, but it's um big job. 
Uh, it is. Uh, it's it's a heavy lift. Uh, I can tell you that uh, every single one of us on the, the, the subcommittees and the, the task force itself for spending numerous hours every week trying to just you know get ahead of this as best we can yeah. um, i agree with you i think that you know the the broader I mean, the globe is this is a global issue it has to understand the difference between good pfas and bad pfas you know in, in paul's presentation he highlighted how many good products we have out you know that we use for as consumers every day yeah. that are looked at as good pfas yeah. right um and part of you know our cell phones have PFAS, you know, or shoes, or yeah, cosmetics, really. or shoes. I mean, anything yeah. that's plastic based. I mean, yeah. uh, food packaging. I mean, it's all over the place. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, if we don't have that, then then where where are we? So, yeah. um, I think it's we have to be able to separate the issues, and yeah. I think that's where we're going towards. Right yeah. now, it's very emotional. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, I, I, and I think as as long as we're, we're we're honest and sincere about about our our presentation and our packaging Absolutely. i think it, i think i think it, it, it'll be okay you know um yep. you know the the you know the europeans you know with their decision that they're going yep. through now over the next year or two they're going to be getting pushback from other people too saying guys you want to live without you know these 500 items right. you know, we, we, we don't know how to make these without that which is good. It's a good PFAS. We don't know how to make those things. Right. What, do you, what do you want to do? You know, it's. Right. I mean, the, 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 that list is long enough for it to be a real, you know, um, economic, you know, on on a, on, a, on a macro scale. That's a hit. It's a significant hit. It, it, you, can't use, you can't you can't use that stuff making these stuff anymore. Starting twenty twenty five. And Paul shared a story with us in the last podcast about. It took him 10 years to figure out Novak 1230. Yeah, yeah. All right. And yeah. I mean, this change is, you know, this relates to PFAS as a whole. We've had issues with foam and it's taken the foam guys seven to 10 years to figure out what their path forward is post, you know, yeah. fluorinated foams to now fluorine free foams. Mm -hmm. Right. But as it relates to fire suppression, you know, when you look at fluoroketones and falling under this umbrella of PFAS, you know, there is no other alternative right now. Yeah. All right. So it's going to take another ten or fifteen years to figure out what's next. Yeah. All right. So it's uh, and, it's interesting. And and and, and the two of the biggest companies that we're talking about here, you know, Carrier and and JCI, they've got they've got exposure with firefighting foam, don't they? Absolutely. And JCI certainly, but 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 Carrier too. Yeah, yeah, carrier to a certain extent, but I thought they sold or yeah, I think they did sell off the national foam line to Angus. Uh, probably Actually, ten years uh, ten years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think Lords, Lords of London was in uh, Lloyd's of so London. Are, are, are there any other publicly traded companies that have a firefighting foam PFAS exposure? I think Perimeter Solutions. I think Perimeter are Solutions public? publicly traded. They acquired Stolberg. They own a number of other forestry based fire wildfire based companies. Uh, yeah, class yeah, A yeah. type fires, uh, yeah. but Perimeter is in that mix as well. And I think they're publicly traded. Yeah. That's going to be around for a long time. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, a long, long time. Yeah. yeah. Um, that, that's going to solve it overnight for sure. But it's back to your point from uh, the issues that we have in front of us today. Let's separate the good from the bad yeah. um, because yeah. we need good yeah. you know, fire yeah, suppression we, agents. Right. I, I, I think we're going to know we're in trouble. And I don't, I, I don't think we're going to get there. When all the talk and all the writing refuses to make that distinction between the good and the bad you know we're gonna we're losing it when when everything is wrapped up in one right. you know it's at some point we got to get the new york times to write a or the wall street journal to, to write a story about the good and bad pfas you, know, you got to get somebody with with readership you know to to, to carry that story electronically because i'm not gonna read it in print yeah i still read some prints yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh i hear you i hear you um yeah. all right so let's Let's kind of wrap some of this stuff up. All right. So when you look at the state of the industry today, the consolidation game that's going on, the moving parts and pieces with the OEMs, I mean, what's your take? I mean, you know, you've seen this for the last 35 years. I mean, you know, what's your view? Where do we go from here? I, I think the it, if you get a little bit granular, and I don't want to get too granular now, maybe it's for another podcast, you get a little bit granular and you look at the different elements of these companies 
let's take on the on the on the on the distributor end of the business. Um, I've seen you may have too that that certain parts of of what a typical fire equipment distributor does make sense to bigger private equity companies, and other parts do not. Yep. I think the special hazard section of of one of these FEDs, it's going to be hard for that new general manager stepping into this business for the first time, reporting to a family office, reporting to a private equity firm to listen to sales guy or the sales gal, you know, on a, on a, on a quote for a half a million dollar install, why the margins got to be taken down so right. low. And, and what do you mean? We don't, it's, it's, I think that into the business, you, you could find a year or two or three or five years from now that that those those roll-ups, those large private equity uh, acquisitions could begin looking at some of their at some of their units. you know this one's a little bit too heavy in in new install and a little yep. bit light in recurring revenue. Maybe we should spin it off. And I think companies like that could be available, you know, where, where they, they could become independent again. They could you know, I agree. I think that there is a strategy, there is a path forward for the right investor in these carve outs. Um, yep. And I think that you and I can, you know, off the top of my head, I know you know the same companies, but they were yep. strong special hazards companies, you know, three years ago. And then when they got acquired, they yep. lost that capability. Yeah. Uh, because those special hazard technicians left. Yep. Uh, the yep. business was no longer chasing yep. that $500,000 installation. Yep. Um, and they weren't going to fly technicians across the country to go do work. And, and we've seen it. You know, we, we, I've, yeah. I've had people in this conference room here, you know, having left one of those big companies saying, I just can't deal with them. And that, that they're not bad. It doesn't make them bad people. No. It's just, no. it, they're good people. It's just their, their model um, just doesn't, just doesn't fit. I think that, and I think, you know, you're always have, um, this 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 entrepreneurial element always says, "Hey, I want to do it myself. Yep. I, I, I'll do it myself." And some of them will succeed, some will fail. But they'll always be there. So I don't I don't know that that much is going to change. Maybe maybe Carrier does spin off all of its fire and security business, and maybe it goes private. Maybe a big private equity buys that grouping there, and maybe and that could be good for the industry. It could be. You know, it shores yeah, some I mean, things up. For sure. Yeah, 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 and, and and it could it could you know what your point from earlier about when you were at Ansel every year you had these conversations about where we're going to spend our 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 R and D money. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Um, that could be you know in a in a privately held company in a newly privately held fire suppression manufacturer that could become important again. Absolutely. You know? Well, it's growth. <laughs> yeah. Right, you have a new agent or a new application. You know, By the way, we don't have new hazard. The, I, I think that you know we haven't talked water mist at all. It's, maybe that's a whole different conversation. Some of these yeah. new ways of putting out fire, um, they'll they'll play some role in, well. in 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 the future. You know, the microsystems will play some role, um, and we still don't know where where floor heaters are going to land. You know, it's you, we're trying to be positive about it, and and I am positive, but we just don't know where this is going to land. I think it, it it gives the industry as a whole an opportunity to pause. Um, and I've talked about this in other podcasts and a, a couple of earlier blogs this year to say, get this, it should take us back to an opportunity to reassess the hazard for the customer. Yep. And don't assume yep. that that floor yep. ketone or that HFC or that water mist solution yep. that's in the specification is the right yep. app or the right solution for that hazard. Yeah. Um, and it should remind all the fire protection contractors and the engineers to reassess yep. and truly understand what are we protecting here? Yeah. Um, because we've, as you know, our industry has been growing so fast and, you know, people are, you know, a lot of moving deck chairs as it relates to people in our industry. And we have a tendency to follow the path of least resistance. Well, the specification says, so I'm going to bid to the spec. Mm -hmm. Right versus taking the time to know the customer and what the customer needs and solving for that hazard. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I hope that this creates an opportunity for contractors and yeah. engineers alike to kind of take that step back and start those uh, those hazard assessments now. Have you seen anything out there, product wise, from anybody that says this product will put out that lithium ion battery fire? This right here, small ones, 
medium sized fires, big fires, this does it. Does it have you seen anything? I haven't seen anything in writing, but I've heard some companies talk about, you know, their agent. In some cases, it's a blended version of a fluoroketone or um I'll only use that reference because I don't it's the only one I've heard. Yeah. Um to say that they can suppress that fire. Now that said, I also know 3M will tell you that you know Novec 1230 will not suppress yeah. a lithium ion fire. Yeah. Um, and it, we just did an 855 NFPA 855 webinar this past week uh, for the FSSA, and our expert, who happened to be a deputy fire chief, fire marshal from the city of Phoenix, it said in his presentation, there is not a known. Uh, fire suppression clean agent uh, that will be able to suppress a lithium ion yeah. fire in yeah. today's market. Yeah. Period. Yeah, not not to maybe backtracking just a little bit. You got Honeywell. That's yes. saying we're in this game, right? Yes, I they mean, are. Yeah, they said we're in. Yep, we got a flora ketone, and we're going to with one twenty. What did you get with? I forget. It's flora ketone and it's a flora ketone and HMO. And, and and they're HMO, right? They're yeah. HMO. Yeah. Um, and we're in this game. Yeah. So it's a blend yeah. though, right? So an HMO floor ketone it, it, blended. Right? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's All a right. blend. But it, it's good to have them positioned that way. Absolutely. And, and, I mean, and they've got, if I understand they're they they've got a huge risk in, in this PFAS decision. Absolutely they do. Right. Absolutely. A lot I mean, of exposure. It's their, whole, it's, it's their whole refrigeration business, not not just fire. Exactly. Exactly. But we do need innovation. We need to continue to find ways to yeah. to you know create you know ba better, safer environments to deal yeah. with the hazards we've got rolling into our communities. Yeah, especially around lithium ion. I mean, that's the yeah. biggest challenge and, we have right now. And and and, and the, the, so that's the dilemma. You know, the big companies, you know, the the publicly traded companies, they're going to have the capital to go after that. And if they, but they'll only do it if they think it's scalable, right? They're not going to go after you know uh, they're not going to pour tons of money into R and D if they think that at the end of, of, of this work, you know, it's a $500 million market, you know, it's going to be kind of, it's, they're only going to go into it if it's scalable. I mean, small, I mean, a, a smaller company might, they might say, listen, I'm happy with that number. I'm going to, I'm going to find the money to invent this new product. And I'll, I'm happy with that. Let me give you a perspective. You know, I've talked about this offline, um, but in the investment community and the energy side, Right, yeah. so we see all this energy storage coming in, and all this transformational product projects yeah. as a whole that relate to energy. There was a group of analysts that said, "Expect that the energy sector will invest one hundred trillion dollars over the next twenty-five years in energy transformation around the world." Yeah. Right, hmm. so coal-fired power plants coming offline. Figuring yeah. out what we're going to do with nuclear slash fusion, yeah. right? Um, how do we harness the power of the sun, wind, water, yeah. uh, you name it, um, and more to come. But when I heard that number, I had to like triple check it to say, do you just said a hundred trillion dollars? Mm. I mean, the U.S. Yeah. Bar the U.S. economy is twenty eight trillion. Yeah. So it's four turns of the U.S. economy. So mm -hmm. in that context. You know, over the next 25 years, um, I mean, you're talking a huge shift. So to your point, if I have a give me 1% of that <laughs> from a market opportunity, because that's where fire is going to fit in that. All right. And, how and, do we protect and, that? Solution? Yeah, no, and, and, and somebody's got to figure out how do we put these fires out? Absolutely. You know, what kind of fires are they? What's the risk here? And how do we put Absolutely. them out? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So right, maybe, so maybe, maybe energy money starts pouring into, into fire and security. It, it, I think it will. Again, because of the lithium ion. Yeah, you're, you're, I mean, this is a, that's a you should line somebody up to talk about about energy and and fire protection. That would be yep. a great. I, that'd, that'd, that'd be, be great, interesting. A great conversation. Um, all right, John. I think we're going to end that con our conversation there as it relates to this episode of of the podcast. But as you know, before I let you go, you know, as we've tried this once before and we had audio issues. I always like to wrap the conversation up with some rapid fire questions. Okay. All right. And so if you remember, I'm going to say we're going to work towards the, the zinger of a question, the debate you and I always have. I know the zinger. By the way, I know the zinger. Okay. Right. So, <laughs> um, so uh, your favorite sports team. Giants. New York Giants. I was going to say Jets or Giants. So you Giants. beat me to it. 
right. Well, although, although um, I was on the phone with, uh, I'm having, uh, I'm having dinner with Dave Pelton in a couple of weeks, and I told him by the time he, it, but when he gets here, I will have a uh, an Aaron Rodgers New York Jets uh, shirt for him. <laughs> nice. That works. That right. works. Um, yeah, I know where right. you live. I knew where you grew up, but just for the benefit of the group, what's your hometown? Where'd Carteret. You Carteret. Uh, born, born and raised in Carteret. It's a small little blue collar town about seven miles from where I'm sitting. Very good. Very yeah. good. And then in high school, your classmates uh, would have voted you most likely to. Uh, this is embarrassing. I shouldn't answer this question. I mean, because they did vote me something, but I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say what it is. You're going to plead the fifth on this one? Don't want to incriminate yourself? Anyway, my, 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 my daughter, my daughter uh, was voted most likely to host a late night talk show. Um, but I, I was I was voted most popular. Not surprised. You might, you might, can you cut that out in, in this podcast here? You cut it out. I don't know. I mean, see what the audience says. <laughs> uh, all right. And of course, the 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 one million dollar question. Yeah. Uh, New Jersey pizza versus Chicago pizza. Yeah. Well, by, I, I'm going to I'm going to be in Chicago giving a presentation in a couple of weeks. So um, you'll have to I'll, I'll tell you where I'm staying and you'll have to guide me to a, a close uh, Chicago pizza place. OK, so I think you and I are going to be at the same conference in a couple of weeks. Um and if you are at the NAFED conference in Chicago. No. Oh, yes. But yes. this is a different one. All right. So if you and I are going to be at NAFED together. Yeah, we'll be at NAFED um, together. I am working towards setting up a pizza, you know, event. Okay. Uh, at a place that my daughter, okay. Paige, bring a shout out to my daughter, Paige, right. uh, will align for us. It's, it's going to be her favorite Chicago tavern style, thin crust. Right. Okay. Pizza and a neighborhood joint um, in uh, Wrigleyville, Lakeview area, Lincoln Park. Gotcha. Okay. Good. 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 That'll be good. So yeah. we'll get a, we'll get a small group of people after the vendor expo Thursday evening, and we'll go run over and grab uh, some pizza. That, that, that's, yeah. That's right. That's when is that? What? That's May. The end of May. End of May. Twenty fifth, twenty sixth. Right. Middle. Yeah. I think May sixteenth. I'm I'm in Arlington Heights. I think for a for a presentation. Uh, I'll I'll give you a couple places yeah. in Arlington Heights too. Good deal. Um, all right. So didn't, but for the audience, uh, John is um, native to Chicago uh, and Mr. Demeter is native to New Jersey. So we always have this debate as to who has the best pizza. I have even gone as far as sending John, John in his office, uh, mm -hmm. frozen pizzas from one of my favorite neighborhood places called Aurelio's Pizza mm -hmm. in Homewood, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, John, uh, Enjoyed the pizza. I'll let you know. What would you like about that Aurelius pizza? Well, just to show you the superiority of Jersey pizza over Chicago pizza, we wouldn't think of freezing our pizza. <laughs> well, anyway, I was going to get it to you, buddy. <laughs> you, you've got to get you've got to get our pizza. You've got to be sitting down at that table when it comes out of the oven and he plops that slice right in front of you. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's our I pizza. understand. I understand. That's the best I, I can I, do. I, I, I'm looking forward to having some Chicago pizza. That was a good pizza, by the way, that that, yeah. that, that you sent me that day. Yeah. I'm looking so, forward we'll, to having we'll it. We'll have more. Yeah. We'll have more. Um, very good. Um, all right. One other thing that we always wrap up every every conversation with, and it speaks to leadership and the greatness of fire protection. And, and I think it creates an opportunity for us to highlight those that we've worked with, those that have uh, that uh, have been most influential and um, those that have been most impactful in our careers. So if you have an opportunity uh, to work with one person who you really looked up to, helped you grow into the leader you are today. Um, who would that be and why? Wow. Hey, grandmother or my father. <laughs> but, but, but my father <laughs> running, <certainly>. running booze. <laughs> running, running, running booze. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the industry, um, I listen, I, you know, we, we, we've got a lot of friends and I, I've got such admiration for everybody in this industry. I, you know, in it, I've never, you know, been a long time since I've worked for anybody, you know, and it's, but, but so I, I I benefit from every conversation that I have, most every conversation I have with the leaders in this industry, yeah. you know, from my involvement with FSSA, where it's such a concentration of really great people, you know, uh, in our industry, you know, you, I, I, I wouldn't want to start naming them because there's too many. And I would miss a bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they, they're, it's, we're, we're full of, we're full of great leaders. We really are. And there's young ones too, you know, we used to think that, well, but they're, you know, the, you look around the, the, the board 
of SSA, some really, really good, you know, young leaders that that, that are coming up that they're, you know, you know, Brenton Harris, you know, um, the, the whole, the whole executive staff, right. Executive board right now. Yeah. Really good Brett, people. Yeah. Brett Stratton. Brett and Brett Stratton. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I, I agree. I, you know, um, today, um, where I'm dropping the uh, podcast, uh, following an interview I did with Todd Stevens and the, uh, next generation of leaders presentation or facilitation yeah. that he led at the conference and the panel that he had up there. Yeah. Um, really, really, one yeah. very diverse. Uh, you had engineers, uh, yeah. male, female yeah. Yeah. owners, you know, divisional heads. Um, but at, to the person, they all talked about you know, the strength of the industry, mm -hmm. you know, what was uh, created a path for them, how they've gotten to where they're at and where they see the industry going. And I think every yeah. single one of them talked about, you know, diversity, core values, yeah. um, and don't being afraid to lean in and step up and, and take on mm -hmm. challenges because, you know, yeah. those who do uh, are the ones that are going to truly grow and, and uh, expand yeah. their career. Yeah. I, I, love, I just thought of this. Um, one guy, Dick Schaefer, who was the vice president of business development at Kitty Aerospace, Dick uh -huh. gave us our first shot at this business. Yeah. And over the years, you know, Dick, you know, laid out for me, here's how it works, you know, Debitor. This is how we're organized. I learned a lot from Dick. I I, uh, I miss the guy. Yeah, that's great. No, and I, I, you know, we've talked about it before. I think that uh, there's, you know, a thousand people that we can identify that have, yeah. you know, helped build the foundation of this industry um, and create an environment for us to be able to stand on today. Yep, exactly. Uh, and then those that we work with side by side today that yep. uh, make it fun every day and, and be a part, you know, fun to be yep. a part of as we yep. build uh, things even better. So, yep. Yep. Good, good all right. Place to be. Well, John Demeter, thank you very much. Appreciate your time and, and uh, joining us on this episode of the podcast. Yeah, John Mackey, thank you for the invite. It's always a pleasure to, to chat with you and uh, look forward to doing it again sometime. Very good. Okay. All right. Thanks, John. Have a great yeah, day. Peace. Bye-bye. Thank you again uh, to John Demeter for sitting down with us. I hope you found our discussion informative and useful. If you'd like to contact John or me, please see our podcast notes. Um, on our or our contact details at the end of this video. Thank you for listening and please be safe. Music